<clears throat> this is my cosmic rosary. It's called, called great story beads. I mean, they're called different things by different people, but each bead signifies some significant event in the history of everyone and everything. This is the whole universe story. I consider each of these a grace moment. And one of the things that we understand from the history of the universe is that one of the main thing that drives evolution and complexity and transform, transformation is chaos, breakdowns, and bad news. Turns out that nothing is more important and chaos, breakdowns, and bad news for catalyzing creativity, catalyzing transformation. As modeled in the title of this essay, I propose that God be spelled, and more importantly, taken to heart, as G, Earth Emoji, D. Chaos, breakdowns, and bad news with an Earth Emoji chaser. Hello, Bezel T3. Just realized I brought my white glasses out here that uh, some of you like and some of you don't like so much doesn't really matter. Look, they're black on the inside, okay? That represents the blackness of my heart because of sin. But the white represents the righteousness which is mine by grace through faith because of Christ Jesus alone. So I'm going to wear them. Plus, I broke my red ones and I'm trying to get those replaced. Anyways, that was the late Michael Dowd who died just last October 2023 from a massive heart attack. Michael was a sustainability activist, religious naturalist, a big history evangelist, whatever that means. Michael was a reverend in the Unitarian Universalist Church and was connected with the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Flint, Michigan. Now, before we get started, I want to share with you just a bit of the last, the very last sermon that Michael preached in Flint, Michigan, to give a little more context of where Michael is coming from. And this is how he begins. So as those of you who have experienced me preaching before know, I have occasionally been known to do what has been called aerobic preaching. Now keep in mind that preaching simply means the act of delivering a message of doctrine or exhortation or instruction. So before we get back to the video connected to the intro that you saw, let's see what kind of preaching Michael offers those listening to him at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Flint, Michigan. His title that day was The Calm in the Storm. What I'd like to offer this morning are just three things that I think can help us, can support us as individuals and as a congregation to be the calm in the storm. Now, we're not going to take time to dig into the three things that he's going to mention, because I think the trajectory of his sermon can be summarized very well in this next clip. Most of us who have a heart, progressives, liberals, people who have been involved in social justice and all kinds of justice and inclusion, we often have been at work for some cases, decades, in terms of genuinely believing that we could still transform the systems. And that's great work, and I encourage you to, to continue with it with as much passion and commitment and devotion. Just to let go of the in order to. Continue doing the work of justice, of inclusion. Continue doing the work of peace, of environmental sustainability. But do it from a heart space of knowing that it's not going to save the world. It's not going to transform the world. But it may help save your soul. It may help you pass the mirror test where you can look at yourself in the mirror and feel good that you're at least doing something in the right direction. Because we're all, remember nesting dolls? I, I like the nesting doll image. You know, we're all part of a nested reality. And I call the whole of that reality God, but I don't spell it the normal way. I spell it G Earth D. Or if I'm doing it on typing, G Earth emoji D. Because then it becomes clear that whatever I'm meaning by the word God includes our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. Okay, I think it's fair to say that Michael was deeply invested in social justice, inclusion, and environmental sustainability. He says it may not change the world, but it may save your soul. He sees God as a nesting doll where we are all part of the divine whole, which he says includes our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. 
In other words, we're all part of G hyphen earth emoji hyphen D. Now, as I've mentioned many times, uh, the, the most common error in understanding what's real is to ignore or confuse the creator-creature distinction. God made everything there is, ex nihilo, out of nothing, including us. We have to understand that the distance between God and man is so great, the substance and character of God and man being so vastly different, that without some extreme condescension on God's part, we could never have any knowledge of him or relationship with him at all. Now, what Michael says about death is really telling and also very timely and, and sad since Michael himself has recently transitioned from this life by death on to the next life after this one. Death is natural and necessary at every level of reality. And the ancients could not have possibly known this in the ways that we do. That's why it's so vital that we continue to honor reality, whether we use God language or secular language, that we honor reality in terms of ongoing revelation and not get frozen in time. Death is no less sacred than life. And thus, Good Fridays are consistently followed by Easter Sundays. The Bible says something so different. It says humans were made by God as a psychosomatic unity of both body and soul or spirit. Those two words are interchangeable in scripture. Adam was made from the dust of the ground, the physical aspect, and the breath of God, which the Bible then calls the spirit or soul of a man. Death then is the very unnatural separation of the body and the soul brought about because of the first couple's disobedience and sinful rebellion against our God and Creator. And so again, this is seeing that death isn't a problem. Death is a necessity that when embraced can have life-changing import. In other words, Good Friday wasn't just something that happened to one God-man 2,000 years ago. It's a fundamental part of the nature of nature. Okay, Good Friday is not a metaphor. According to the Bible, Good Friday was a one-time event de detailing the unspeakable physical and spiritual suffering, Roman-style crucifixion and death of the God-man Christ Jesus. And as a result of his shed blood, death, and then glorious resurrection, we who trust in him have an enduring hope. Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. Paul continues, for he must reign, right? In the kingdom of heaven right now, he is reigning at the right hand of the Father until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Again, according to the Bible, death is unnatural and it is our last enemy to be conquered. What matters most, of course, is our legacy. Whatever has given your life meaning, whatever the thousands of things that have given your life meaning, the final meaning of your life is your legacy. You know, I worked for an extremely wealthy man as an aircraft maintenance technician for almost all of my 37 years in aviation. He was a well-known captain of industry in Los Angeles, who as I'm sitting here talking to you is now 100 years old. Now, this is a picture of a building that he had built in Westwood, California. I mean, he really liked red brick. Even the FBO I worked out of, uh, he built with red brick. Brick. He really liked this stuff. Now, if you look carefully, there was a large monument sign with his name to the right of the main entrance of that building. And as you look at this next picture, you can see that that monument is no longer there. And if you were to ask someone walking by today, that building, who built it and what the name of the building was called, they probably, most likely, could not tell you. So much for a man's legacy. 
until we grasp that death plays a vital and necessary role in an evolving cosmos, Christianity will be shackled by unnatural, otherworldly notions of the gospel. So, death is natural, but the gospel is unnatural and otherworldly? <laughs> See, this is more evidence that Michael is totally ignorant or unaware of what the real gospel is and why it is so necessary in order to be reconciled to God, the infinitely holy God who is not spelled with an earth emoji. One of the things we do a lot is visit graveyards. In fact, literally three nights ago, we slept in a graveyard. And I love it because one of the things that we do religiously is we'll look at the gravestones. We didn't do this the other night, but we'll look at the gravestones. You know, whatever this person may have believed about his or her soul or spirit or consciousness, you know, whatever it was that they believed continued after death, that helped them live a good life. I am just nothing but a bow of gratitude and respect to that practical truth wisdom that maybe helped them. But from the perspective of every life form in the universe, this person is everlastingly dead. And I am soon going to be just as everlastingly dead in terms of my body. You know, Michael sadly had no idea just how soon those words would be true about him. You see, none of us know the day. Proverbs 27.1 tells us, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Or we could look at Ecclesiastes 9 verse 12, for a man does not know his time, like a fish that are taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. You see, last October 2023, Michael died from a heart attack and is now dead. But according to God's word, Michael is not everlastingly dead. Unlike you and I who are at this moment alive, Michael is experiencing what's called the intermediate state. Michael's body has now been buried or cremated, whatever the case may be, but his soul or spirit, you know, that immaterial aspect of who Michael is, that aspect is very much consciously alive. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, and do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. The end of this, uh, I should say, at the end of this present evil age, Michael's body will be resurrected, and that resurrected body and soul will be reunited either in everlasting glory or everlasting corruption, depending on what he did, sadly, with what he called the unnatural and otherworldly gospel of Jesus Christ. From here on out, Michael says some pretty amazing things, and I want to share just a couple of them with you. Our supremely natural destiny is everlasting death. And that doesn't mean that you can't continue to have whatever beliefs that you might have that inspire you. But in terms of your material existence, we're all going to be everlastingly dead soon. You know, he, Michael says that with such confidence, but it is so different from what we find in the words that the Lord Jesus said to Martha in John chapter 11. We read there, <clears throat> he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he says, he asks Martha, and by extension to you and me, do you believe this? One of our dearest colleagues in the religious naturalism movement, <clears throat> the sacred realism movement, is Loyal Rue, and I love this quote. Death is the entrance fee paid on exiting. Death is the entrance fee paid on exiting. The entrance to what? <laughs> Nothingness? Everlastingly and unconsciously melding into the cold, dry molecules of stellar space? You know, no judgment, no accountability for, one, for, for, for how one lived one's life. I'm sorry, but even a hardened atheist that, that's being rational about things would have a difficult time denying the utter uniqueness of mankind that separates us from the rest of creation. I mean, a beaver can build a crude dam, you know, in a, in a stream, 
But can a group of beavers build Hoover Dam? Birds can sing, you know, sometimes very pretty. Sometimes they annoy me when I'm trying to still sleep in the back. They're in the backyard and I'm very close to it. But can they write and perform Handel's Messiah? You see, there is a fee, all right, but in, it's in terms of a debt that we owe our Creator. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, because of sin, we all have earned, well, a pay packet of everlasting condemnation. But God offers eternal life in Christ Jesus as a free gift. And yet, original and ongoing sin is so dark and black, I mean Exxon Valdez oil spill black, that left to our own devices, unless God intervenes, we will always recoil and run from that wonderful free gift. A while back, Michael had a serious form of cancer and says this about the prospect of his own demise. I had what religious people call the peace that passes understanding. And it wasn't because I was holding out hope for pearly gates and mansions when I die. I want to say, everyone is religious. It's just a matter of what it is that you worship. And that is an interesting passage that Michael uses. It's Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But it has nothing to do with pearly gates and mansions. It has to do with God no longer having enmity or offense against us. Romans 5 verse 1 and 2 says it well. Therefore, since we have been justified by grace alone through faith alone, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace which we stand, in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Pearly gates and mansions? Mm -mm, no. When one understands the gospel, it's all about God and his goodness and glory as seen in his beloved son, Jesus. I'm a sacred realist. I'm a religious naturalist. It seems to me pretty clear that where we go to when we die is the same place we came from before we were born. And whether you speak of that as coming from God and returning to God, or coming from mystery and returning to mystery, or coming from nothing and returning to nothing, I think all those are legitimate ways of talking about it. But as I sometimes say, and I'm not just joking, I mean this, if where I go to when I die isn't the very same place that all other plants and animals and bacteria have gone, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> you know, it's so ironic that Michael who because of human sinfulness is displaying a serious anti-God allergy here, is wearing a clerical collar. <laughs> Again, he is so diminishing the greatness and grandeur of mankind as being made in the image of God. This Psalm of David is so opposite of Michael's take on who we are as humans. We read, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's Psalm Chapter 8. I don't think we humans get to go to some special place that the rest of the living biosphere doesn't get to go to. Now, I know that Michael does not believe the Bible to be God's word. But regardless, if it is true, and I'm confident it is because Jesus was confident it is, and we read in Genesis that God says, let us make man in our, em in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion, just like Psalm was saying, over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And if that's true, out of all of creation, only humans are made in God's image. Now, that's not that we look like God, but rather that we share in some, not all, of his attributes. Then why would it be a stretch to think that he has better plans for his redeemed people who love him 
than plants and animals and bacteria, who, by the way, will be restored and renewed at the last day, as it says in Romans 8, verse 21, uh, verse 20 and 21. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So I mentioned before Stephen Jenkinson, his documentary, Grief Walker, <laughs> Die Wise. I love this quote, not success, not growth, not happiness. The cradle of your love of life is death. That's what I want to call egg timer theology. You know, we all have this cosmic egg timer and none of us know when it's going to ding. And when it dings, it's over. Time's up, the egg is hard boiled and you're done. Okay. Now what's so amazing to me is this. Michael now knows the most important truth that can ever be known. And that is what happens to a person after death. And if Jesus is right about the truth of God's word, which I'm convinced he is, and it is God's word, then this is what we can say that scripture teaches. It's, it's tightly summarized in the Westminster Confession of Faith. I think it's chapter 31. We read there, the bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption. As Paul makes clear in Acts 13, 36, he says, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But, the, the confession goes on, their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal subsistence. And remember, immortality is a gift from God to humans. We, we are not eternal, we're not immortal by um, our just human constitution. It is God's gift. Immediately return to God who gave them, as Jesus declared to the penitent thief on the cross next to him as they were both dying. The souls of the righteous, being then made perfect in holiness, are received into the highest heavens where they behold the face of God in light and glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies. But the souls of the wicked are cast into hell, the place we are told in Acts 1 verse 25 where Judas ended up. They remain in torments and utter darkness, reserved to the judgment of that great day. Besides these two places for souls separated from their bodies, the scripture speaks of nowhere else. Friends, don't let your egg timer ding without confessing your sin to God, turning from it and praying God's mercy upon you, and trust in the person and work of Christ Jesus alone for your salvation from sin and its pay packet of death, and you will be saved. Trust in the Lord Jesus today.